Hello world, and welcome to the What is a Church series. This is a series where I take you through my study as to what a church is. To let you know what I'm doing is I'm going from Acts 1, working through the New Testament, and I'm trying to see what a church is according to the Bible. I'm doing this without my own preconceptions of what a church is because I want to see what the Bible says and not read into it my own beliefs. And the reason why I'm doing this is because there are many groups who claim to do things the way the book of Acts did or be a book of Acts church. And I want to see what the Bible really sees. Now, um, we've already done the introduction where I explained all of this uh, in a lot more detail. And parts 1 and 2, we looked at Acts chapters 1 and 2 uh, and came with a rough idea of what a church is. Uh, I will link the playlist uh, down below and at the end of the video, so if you want to see those parts, you can. But we're now at part 3, and what we're looking at today, what I looked at this week, is Acts chapters 3 and 4. I'll give you a quick overview of what's happening in those chapters, and then I will tell you what I learned from it as a church, and I will give you the summary based on Acts chapters 1 to 4, what a church is. Okay, so what happens is, um, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. We've already established in previous parts that this is something they did. They went to the temple daily. Um, apparently they went to pray. So Peter and John are on their way there. They come across a beggar, and they say to this beggar, we have silver and gold we don't have, but in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And the man stands up and walks, and it causes quite a commotion in the temple. So much so that people are asking questions, and Peter and John start telling people what's going on, and they start preaching the resurrection of Jesus. Now the Sadducees do not believe in resurrection, so they get upset. They uh, arrange for their arrest. They're arrest, uh, locked up of night. Next day they come before the leaders, and that is the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, all of them. Uh, they're in front of the whole group. And they start talking and the group pretty much threatens them and tells them, stop preaching the name of Jesus. We don't mind what you do, just don't do that. And um, Peter, who does most of the talking again, makes it pretty clear they can't because they will obey God, not man. So they're threatened and they let free because they can't keep them there because there's no real reason. They haven't really committed a crime. They just healed someone. They go back to the uh, other believers who all pray together because of, uh, you know, pray for God's protection. They're filled with Holy Spirit a second time. And uh, the church continues to function. So what do we learn when we read this chapter is, uh, first of all, Peter and John went to the temple to pray. So we've already established they go to the temple daily uh, and that the believers pray. And this is still being seen as the pattern. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, we did read that people were selling and giving what they got to provide for needs in the church. We now see an example of a man who's not part of the believers, who is begging. And Peter and John don't give him of those funds. Now, it could be they just didn't have anything with them. Or is this a matter of uh, the funds that came in are for the believers are for the believers. Uh, whatever the case, they didn't give the man anything. They did, however, give him uh, a healing. They, in the name of Jesus, and he stood up and walked. So there is healing, but there is no sharing of funds with non-believers. Um, we see the healing is done in the name or the, the power or the authority of Jesus. Um, we also see that again when uh, questions are asked, Peter's, Peter's the one that's preaching. Again, we have established Peter's character would sort of be the one to make him do that. We still haven't seen that Peter has a position there, but it would seem that Peter's taken some sort of a position because he's doing this more often now. Um, and this is just a group dynamic. When you have a group of people together, there seems to be this natural leader who stands up. So maybe that's happened, I, but it's not an official position. Uh, we also see that um, the numbers grow from three to 5,000. Um, so that is a large group. Um, it's also clear in what they're talking about is that no one is saved but by the name of Jesus. So in order to be saved, it has to be through the name of Jesus. Again, the power in the name. So um, that is an important part of being a Christian is your salvation is in the name of Jesus. Also, uh, it's very clear that we are never to deny Jesus. We do what God commands, not man. So even when authorities uh, tell us, hey, stop, we still do what God commands. So that's important to note. Um, one of the things we also see is in adversity we pray. It's what the Christians did uh, when John and Peter came back the next day and explained what happened. They immediately went to pray for God's protection and help. And guidance to the situation so that's important for us we see the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens a second time and the reason why I say that is while Jesus says you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit it's very clear when the Bible says in Acts 2 they were filled with the Holy Spirit that that was the moment of baptism and those exact same words in Greek are used again in Acts 4 when it says they were filled 
with the Holy Spirit again as I'm testifying. So it seems that baptism is a recurring event. Um, if that means we run out of Holy Spirit or how that works, I don't know. The, the baptism and the filling um, at this point I'm looking at as the same thing. Uh, we'll see if uh, they differentiate between them later on. But at the moment, Jesus said, wait for the baptism, then you start. They were filled and then they started. So um, mathematically, if A equals B and C equals B, then A equals C. So it comes out to that point. So that's the filling. We also see that it does say the church was of one heart and one soul. Um, so it does mean that uh, they were in agreement of everything. Now at this point, it is easy to do that. There were 12 guys, the apostles leading and teaching. So it's very, and they were taught by Jesus. So it's very hard to get differences. Um, but it does kind of make you wonder if for a church to function, what do you do when there are disagreements? Um, we'll see later on how they deal as those things come along. But at this point, they were of one heart and one soul. And I think that is good for us as Christians uh, or churches or home group studies or however we are put together, that that's what we strive for, being of one of heart and soul. Because if we have disagreements, it is hard to function as a group. Um, we also see the apostles after the filling of the Holy Spirit testified, in Je testified of Jesus again and of his resurrection. Um, and it does appear that at this point the apostles are the main ones who do most of the preaching and the talking. So that is an interesting note. We'll see how that goes further. Um, and again, we come to the point where they had all things in common. We've mentioned before that um, this does entail um, how this works in the historical context because of all the people uh, who were in Jerusalem at Pentecost to celebrate the feast. And that um, they didn't have the possessions with them, so they were in need, and those who had would sell to provide for those. Uh, we also get the example of Barnabas, and um, it mentions Barnabas is from Cyprus. So you might think, oh, so did he go back to Cyprus to sell it? But when you look at, because uh, that's a question that came to me, is I thought, this is interesting. Um, Barnabas is from Cyprus, yet he sold what he had to provide as well. And it's mentioned specifically, so I thought I'd look it up. But uh, church history, uh, church tradition, or history, uh, teaches us that uh, Barnabas had moved to Jerusalem many years earlier, and had actually uh, studied under Gamaliel, who had also taught Saul of Tarsus. Um, and I thought that was interesting. It means he had been there already a while. So he had probably already gathered some form of land or goods maybe while he was there. Studied to be a Pharisee, uh, like Saul did. Um, for whatever reason, we don't know if he completed or not, but he was now a believer. And um, it also explains why um, he was so um, connected to Saul in the beginning. Is these two knew each other from the past, and maybe they were friends at some, in some way. Um, so an interesting thought uh, there. Um, Maybe we'll find more about that later on, maybe not, we'll see, but very interesting. But that brings us uh, to a couple of points that we see over how the church was functioning. So what does that tell us about a church? Well, there's not really too much new information, um, apart from the question as to whether or not you should uh, be giving to the poor or not. I think personally you should, but, apparent, but should a church really be doing that? It would seem that the early church did not in Acts 4, uh, in Acts 3 and Acts 4. Um, we have to wait and see how that develops. Well, what do we know about a church now? Basically, those are the believers in Jesus' resurrection. They believe he rose, died for their sins and rose from the grave. And they were saved by Jesus' name. And they are of one heart and one soul. And what they did is they came together to pray. Um, this was a, a habit, uh, as we read, because I went to the temple. But it's also they would pray in adversity, uh, as we also read after the arrest of uh, Peter and John. We also know they would praise God and study the scriptures. We've seen that earlier. And we know that they went to the temple together. Again, historical context, there is no temple anymore, so we can't do that. But they did go to a central place for prayer. Uh, Pete and John did. So, um, interesting to see how that uh, uh, unfolds later on. But apparently that's something that you do. Uh, what we also know is um, they were in fellowship, which means they ate together. There was a breaking of bread. And it mentions they broke bread, but they also broke bread in houses, to mention that they did it generally, but they also did it specifically in people's houses. Uh, and also we see that they have all things in common, those who have provide for those who are in need. Um, again, the historical context to keep in mind, um, but there was definitely that provision. Uh, that provision did not go to those outside of the group of believers, um, as in the case of the beggar. And uh, as far as positions in the church, we still only have the apostles. An apostle is someone who was with Jesus from his baptism till his resurrection. 
that is the criteria placed in Acts chapter 1. Um, so there are no more apostles today because no one is that old uh, to have done that. So that's a, no longer a function, but it was in the beginning. And what they did is they uh, taught the people and um, they did miracles. They testified of Jesus' resurrection. They did most of the preaching. Um, but that is at this point in Acts 4. We'll see how it goes further. If you'd like to be able to uh, have this information um, on a readable form, it is on my blog, hertjera.com. And uh, on my ministry site, sciencebasedchristianity.com, you can find the articles there as well, in written form. They're more bullet-pointed, but that's because those, these are my study notes, uh, but I'm sharing them with you. And uh, I thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, and um, follow me on this journey as we discover what a church is according to the New Testament. Keep well, and God bless.